So welcome, everyone. If I could ask uh, you to take your seats, we'll get started. I'm Chris Walker, Vice President for Studies and Analysis at the National Endowment for Democracy. On behalf of NED's International Forum for Democratic Studies, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's presentation, Central and Eastern Europe, Power, Fairness, and the Future of Democracy, featuring Reagan Fassell Democracy Fellow, Dimitrina Petrova. We are delighted to have with us as a discussant, Roger Patotsky, Senior Director for Europe here at the National Endowment for Democracy. Funded by the US Congress, the Reagan Fassell Democracy Fellows Program hosts some of the world's most de dedicated democracy activists, scholars, and journalists to conduct independent research and pursue projects at the NED. Now in our 17th year, the program has hosted more than 270 fellows from over 90 countries since its founding in 2001. Within this remarkable group, our speaker today stands out for her unwavering commitment to democracy in Central and Eastern Europe. After the revolutions of 1989 and the decades of corrupt and corrosive communist rule, Central and Eastern Europe was on an upward trajectory in democracy terms. Yet nearly 30 years on, many countries in the region are struggling to navigate political trends and forces that in a number of respects are global in scope and which are challenging liberal democratic standards. Various explanations have been advanced for this retreat of democracy with some observers stressing global trends and others citing the gravitational pull of the region's communist past. In this presentation, Bulgarian human rights defender Dimitri Dimitrina Petrova will offer an alternative explanation of the notion of the region's transition to democracy, as well as some reflections on the current political landscape in Central and Eastern Europe. She'll assess the transformative potential of civic activism in the region and ask if democratic values and human rights are still shaping young people's aspirations for a better world. To conclude, she will provide insights into where activism in the region might go next. Dr. Dimitrina Petrova is a, Bulg a Bulgarian human rights defender and political analyst. Before returning to Bulgaria in early 2017, she was executive director of the Equal Rights Trust, a London-based NGO that she established to promote a comprehensive approach to non-discrimination and equality. From 1996 to 2006, she was based in Budapest, where she served as the founding executive director of the European Roma Rights Center. During this time, she also taught human rights politics and other subjects at Central European University. From 1990 to 1991, she was a member of the Bulgarian parliament, having been elected as a result of her activism in Bulgarian dissident groups under communism. As an MP, she participated in the drafting of the 1991 constitution. She's conducted in-depth research projects in more than 60 countries and is the author of more than 100 publications on political and social issues, human rights, and equality. She holds a PhD from the University of Sofia. Roger Pototsky is Senior Director for Europe at the NED, where he served for more than 29 years. Roger oversees NED's grant-making programs in Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, the Balkans, and Central Europe. He's written frequently on political developments in Central and Eastern Europe and taught the history of the region at Georgetown University. He holds an MA in Russian and East European Studies from Yale University and was a Fulbright Scholar at Jagiellonian University in Poland. We'll now turn the floor over to Dimitrina, who will speak for approximately 30 minutes, followed by Roger. Note, uh, for those of you on Twitter, you can follow this presentation and contribute to the conversation by using the hashtag NEDEvents or by following the forum at, at ThinkDemocracy and the endowment at NEDDemocracy. And if you haven't already done so, please take a moment now to silence your cell phones. Uh, and finally, let me take this opportunity to thank the many staff members involved with this event and most especially Research Associate Jenny Barker, who's over here, uh, who's offered vital assistance to the fellowship project and to today's presentation. And with that, pleased to hand it over to Dimitrina. Thank you, Chris. 
It is a privilege to speak to you today, and I'm very grateful to Ned for organizing this event. You're certainly all aware of the broad existing consensus that liberal democracies in Central and Eastern Europe are backsliding. By the way, it's increasingly uh, difficult to agree the regional labels for group of countries in my part of the world. So to clarify, when I say Central and Eastern Europe, or just the region, I will mean countries that, are, that once were communist, that are now all members of the European Union, and all of them, according to the most recent report of Freedom House, have backslided in their democratic performance, with the sole exception of Estonia, which registered a modest improvement, and Slovakia, which remained the same. Um, the purpose of my talk is to reflect on the possibility of turning the tide of illiberalism and sliding democracy forward. But I feel duty bound to say a couple of words about my own understanding of the nature and causes of the uh, democratic recession in the region. People have identified main determinants in global illiberal trends in the communist past and, in my view most promisingly, in developments within the region after 1989. These factors that have been identified, I think they are all contributing to what we observe today. They are all good, probably, causes. But my problem with them is that none of them, taken separately, is actually telling us, explains definitively, why people are making those illiberal choices, both electorally, in terms of elections and, and, and in other areas. Um, now, what if we just take all those factors and put them together? Would a cumulative uh, effect give us a better picture of what's going on and a better um, explanation? Yes, maybe, but I personally would not be completely satisfied with that because the political behaviors that would follow from each of those factors or causes would cancel each other out. Therefore, I would prefer to speak in terms of layered causality where I, while acknowledging all those factors or causes that have already been identified, I would look for a deeper underlying root cause of which all these factors are uh, derivatives. And I have put those surface causes on the hoofs of my little giraffe, which represents the political scientists. And I'm seriously in the although in a very old-fashioned uh, way, looking for a root cause. Uh, and I actually find uh, such a cause. I believe there is a major occurrence when, in the early 1990s, in the area of social status mobility and elite formation, and by status, by social status, I mean uh, income and wealth and power together, and what happened? What happened is that a new pattern of mobility, of upward mobility emerged, and that pattern was completely, entirely, utterly non-meritocratic. And how was that pattern experienced by most people? As generalized unfairness regarding who succeeds in life, and especially who reaches the top. And that experience was blamed on all those elites who presided over the transition, with the result 
that, uh, you know, the elite has no legitimacy, which opens the door to uh, populist alternatives. I would like to look a bit closer at what I call for short unfairness and try to explain what I mean by it. But I need to take a, you a step back to a baseline in terms of public attitudes. My baseline, I, I'll not go deeper into history, I'll just take 89, the year 89. Now the grand narrative of 1989 is about freedom. In communism, people had no freedom. People wanted freedom. People got freedom. Fine, that's all true. But that's part of the story. And the other part that has not been properly told and has been under-researched uh, 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 and under-theorized is the story of equality. Or rather, the story of the failed promise, uh, 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 communist promise of equality. Uh, I was a member of Echo Glasnost. This was an environmental uh, group which in the uh, fall, not autumn, the fall of 1989 was campaigning in the streets of uh, Sofia, Bulgaria. And we had lots of slogans and we had written them on uh, posters and placards and billboards. And they were about rights and liberties and democracy. And there was one there which read, every Bulgarian millionaire sponsor to Eko Glasnost. That was the most thrilling one, the most exciting one. People reacted most vividly to this one because the most sensitive issue at the time was the privileges of the communist nomenclatura. People resented them. And the very mention of communist millionaires was a bomb. So the point is, people filled the streets and the squares of Eastern Europe in 89 in their hundreds of thousands, not because, not only because, and not primarily because they were driven by liberal values, but because of their resentment of communist privilege. They were let down on the communist promise of equality. And that's the baseline. So people then, the consensus was, OK, we will not have socioeconomic equality. We are going forward to a new society. We give up on equality. But people did not give up on their expectation of fair play as regards who gets ahead in life and who reaches the top. And with that expectation, what followed very shortly afterwards was this. It was the beginning of a market economy, launched quickly after the revolutionary breakthrough. And it was, shock, uh, it was a shock therapy. It was the overnight introduction of unregulated prices. Prices shot up. People lost their lifetime savings. In the meantime, the Communist Party was hectically distributing state assets to uh, its faithfuls, and that happened in practically every country in the region, uh, you know, quickly grabbing, distributing. And then there was this shady deals of privatization, insider privatization, uh, and all that was extremely disorderly. People, uh, you know, people were confused. There was there were shortages, there were queues, and, uh, and, and uh, confusion. And when the dust settled, uh, what did we see? Who were the beneficiaries? Well, two types. <laughs> the same communist elites and newcomers who had managed to take advantage of the twilight zone in which there were no clear rules of the game, no clear legislation. And there's lots of um, abuse of power, theft, fraud, racketeering, and fake bankruptcies, and mafia, and it was a moral catastrophe. And our cardinal error was that we neglected to create clear legislation before we launched any reform at all in, in, uh, in the economy. 
And so that's what happened. The model that emerged was a completely non, actually anti, anti-meritocratic model of, uh, of upper mobility. And see, I'm talking here about something, a major occurrence that happened in the early 1990s, right? So, but why now? Why are we paying the price 20, 25, 30 years later? If we assume that liberalism began to unravel in the region toward the end of the first decade of the 21st century, it's one generation, uh, 20 to 30 years, and it's a crucial point where, to put it simply, it has now become too soon to, it's now too soon to forget, to forget the dirty origins of the elite and of the social uh, hierarchy, but it's too late to undo it. And so, you know, we have today the best bellwether of how far people get in life is who their parents are. There's no more fishing in muddy waters. Um, so uh, there we are. Uh, a, a clarification. The unfairness I'm talking about is not about inequality. It's not about personal impoverishment. It's not about winners and losers of the transition. It's not lagging behind the West in terms of living standards or about today's corruption. In fact, it's about essentially about dignity. It's about an insult of dignity. People were humiliated. People did not existentially compare themselves with their, uh, you know, with distant citizens of London or New York. Nor did they compare themselves with their former self and say, oh, I was uh, richer, now I'm poorer, or whatever. They compare with their peers. And the basic experience is something, it goes something like this. Oh, my classmate, so-and-so, was a thug, a bully, a liar, not a bright student, cheated during exams, and now he's a banker. It's a moral catastrophe. So that's uh, what we had. And this insult, this, uh, this humiliation, actually, I see it as that thing which transformed itself into all those so-called factors of the illiberal term that hit us later. You know, it trans you know it, it's one thing to have inequality, but it's another thing to have inequality which you experience as a completely illegitimate thing because of how it was produced. And very importantly, this feeling of hurt, psychologists tell us, uh, you know, when people are humiliated and abused and insulted, this hurt soul has a way of projecting itself outwards and turning the abused into abusers. And on a mass scale, on a group scale, producing those effects of uh, virulent uh, racist ethno-nationalism and xenophobia. So if that uh, makes sense, uh, I would like to now turn to, so how do we, what do we do about it now? And can we slide democracy forward? And what would be the best case scenario? And what I would, to, would like to try to do is something like to uh, uh, put together the job description sort of, and the personal specification of the candidates of who can do it. And because we are talking about liberal democracy, the first thing we want, which is non-negotiable, is to carry forward achievements in the area of human rights, civil liberties, political rights. But then, I believe that part of that job description is strategies in uh, three key areas. First, redressing social injustice. And by this I mean uh, coming up with much more meritocratic policies, but because many people no longer can contribute uh, and can um, compete on merit, uh, th th there should also be a strong uh, safety net 
of social welfare. There should be a much better policy link between educational achievement and jobs. There should be a reform of the world of work. In Central and Eastern Europe today, the world of work is nothing like that in the West. Things like uh, recruitment, appointment, promotion, salaries, benefits, don't work like in the West, despite the existence of laws that nobody, uh, nobody complies with anyway. It's a world of connections, nepotism, corruption, and sheer incompetence in that area. Now, the other big area that needs a strategy, I believe, concerns, uh, I call it, reclaiming national identity. Now, the values of national interest, national identity, uh, national sovereignty, pride, this area of values and policies, liberals in Central and Eastern Europe, I think in contrast to liberals in the West, have left, have just reconciled themselves that that area belongs to the illiberal nationalists. Uh, how shall I put it? Liberals in my part of the world are fastidious about patriotism. They you wouldn't listen, to, you know, when they speak to, to speak about national pride or anything. And I believe that needs to change. I believe liberals need to reclaim that territory and transform it and rid the national idea of the racist, ethno-national, xenophobic features, because it is a value in itself. And even pragmatically, I believe the tide of nationalism is so strong, the surge of national revival is so strong, that I don't think it would be a great idea for liberals to try to uh, stop the tide by a couple of universalist incantations. Uh, and, and I also think that within that area of reclaiming national uh, identity and national sovereignty as issues and policies, uh, there should be uh, also a ba balanced foreign policy uh, strategy. And last uh, uh, area, last uh, uh, third, but probably uh, of really critical value is ensuring citizen participation. Um, anybody's participation, uh, especially, however, the youth. I think my successful candidates for sliding democracy forward would be parties, coalitions, movements, persons who would have learned to serve the digital tide of youth activism. Uh, you know, millennials and the children of millennials in Central and Eastern Europe today are already uh, coming up with exciting new ways of social uh, activism and political participation. And uh, I think liberals need to pay attention to that. Now, when I talk about sliding democracy forward, I don't think that we should or could restore previous forms of liberal democracy. Rather, we should push for a better democracy. And I believe that the future can be what I call in procedural, the procedural aspect of democracy, a three-dimensional or 3D democracy. Uh, digital, direct, and deliberative. Now, there exist trends which I have put on the inevitability horizontal axis, such as the development of technologies, universal access to interactive media, the growth of knowledge. These are value neutral. The internet is neither inherently democratic or, or inherently anti-democratic. Um, Democrats recruit supporters online, but so does Islamic State. So it's politics, it's political action that can take the trends 
of inevitability, so to say, in both uh, terrific and terrible directions. And upwards is the, ter the positive territory of democratic utilization of the trends, each of these trends turning respectively to digital, direct, and deliberative democracy. And of course, there are many uh, worst case scenarios that end up uh, with different forms of undemocratic polity. A couple of words about direct democracy. I'm fully aware that direct democracy is, um, uh, is a bit suspicious, but I think that's because when people hear about direct democracy, they think about referendums. And of course, that's not the case any longer. Today, direct democracy means any form of direct citizen participation in various stages of the democratic process up to decision making. And uh, so it's not just about uh, a referenda. Uh, and and uh, a referenda is something that I too have a problem uh, with. But you know, Europeans, East Europe, Central and East Europeans do like direct democracy. 69% of the Poles and 67% of Hungarians said in a recent uh, Pew Research Center study that they approve of and want direct democracy. Um, now, uh, the relationship between digital and, democr and deliberative democracy uh, is a classical uh, dilemma because the larger the size of the decision-making group, the shallower the will expression, and in the extreme case of the whole electorate, people are just voting yes, no. Do you want to leave the European Union? Yes, no. And we get Brexit, which broke my heart. But uh, it doesn't need to be so, and the game changer is digital democracy. Uh, today, people are uh, inventing because that's driven by the need, I think, for direct democratic decision making. And people are, uh, are inventing tools that are decentralized protocols, uh, protocols based on blockchain technologies, making possible secure voting schemes and sophisticated ones at that, uh, following deliberation. That's beautiful stuff. Um, and people are experimenting with Bitcoin and liquid democracy, and there's a vision even of something that's called wiki democracy. Uh, so, but, okay, now let's uh, look back at this relationship uh, uh, between democracy, 3D democracy as procedure, and populism. Uh, well, admittedly, we're all afraid of uh, the surge of populism, and populism is indeed a dark, dark cloud, but I believe there is a silver lining to populism and direct democracy, maybe that silver lining, but only if it is at the same time deliberative, which is made possible by digital. I believe that when we talk about populism, we tend to see, in fact, to merge together two types of trends or two types of attitudes. Those who really would rather have an authoritarian regime and those who actually want more democracy. And if we look, for example, here, that's a recent Gallup international study of approximately 70 countries. People were asked to uh, agree or disagree with statements uh, such as, um, the will of the people is respected. The country is being led in the right direction. The government is efficient. In the red zone are those who disagree. And all the Western democracies, as well as Central and East European democracies, are in the red zone. People disagree. They say, hmm, no, citizens don't have a voice. No, uh, the country is not led in the right direction. And here, we, with our confirmation bias, because we are obsessed with populism and we don't like it and we are afraid of it, we will say, voila, it just confirms it's populism. You know, alienation between the, uh, of the elite and the gap between the, uh, the elite and the public. However, is it not also 
that citizens of Western democracies and Central European democracies actually have much higher expectations of their democracies. They want more democracy, not less. And I think that's the right answer. And I think that 3D procedural democracy uh, actually contributes to um, resolving the tension that's hidden behind this picture, namely addresses the issue of uh, the dwindling um, attraction of mainstream parties, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the alienation of people from politics, the distance between elites, ruling elites and, uh, and electorates, and so on. I see precursors of 3D democracy in Central and Eastern Europe today in many ways, in many forms, in many campaigns. For example, the wonderful campaign with, with which I'm absolutely fascinated, the protests that, uh, that uh, succeeded in stopping the terrible ACTA in 2012. They started from Warsaw and they spread across Eastern Europe and then Western Europe and they succeeded. And the average age there was something like 20. And it was about direct uh, democracy, and it was all digital, and it was based on online deliberation. Uh, there are innovative practices inside the traditional political parties, things like, for example, the members of those parties are asked to vote online on an issue, and then the results are fed to the elected representatives who then in parliament would vote accordingly. New parties are emerging digital democracy parties all over the place. Uh, and actually, the Czech Pirate Party, a uh, civil libertarian party supporting participatory democracy, came in third in the recent parliamentary election with a tiny uh, uh, margin from the party that came second. There are ephemeral things that are uh, also emerging, disappearing, and so on. There was uh, a similar organization in Bulgaria. I don't even know whether it's there yet. It doesn't matter. The soil is moving. The ground is moving. Something is trying to get born there. NGOs are a fascinating world, especially those that are youth-led and that focus on youth. Just an example, there are many, but just an example taken arbitrarily, the Prague Civil Society Center has this project, Unlock, which recognizing the tired and tested methods of civic participation is coming up with alternative uh, tech-based strategies such as, for example, they do hackathons, gamification, uh, online campaigning uh, workshops, and drones, and data analytics. Cool stuff. However, we're talking about liberal democracy here, so we absolutely cannot uh, drop the fourth dimension, let's put it this way, human rights. And my next and last question is the following. Is the human rights movement in Central, in Central and East Europe today fit for purpose? Can it be part of a best case scenario of turning the tide? Or would it be a liability rather? Or would it be just irrelevant? I'm afraid my answer is that in its current shape, it's not fit for purpose. It faces a number of threats. Threats coming from the public, a decline of popular legitimacy. Threats coming from the government, the so-called closing spaces. People say for civil society, I disagree, it's closing spaces for a small part of civil society, those that really threaten the government, not for civil society as such. Then uh, threats coming from funders, uh, the lack of sustainability. Western funders, American funders basically withdrew. Don't know about Ned. Um, not felt very much there. The European Union has its way of funding which does not necessarily fund human rights, not at all. And local philanthrop philanthropy definitely does not fund human rights. And then there's something else. There's uh, the th threats that come from within civil society itself, because a, a very small part of civil society is actually human rights or rights-based. The larger part are service provision and other organizations which are drowning the small human rights voice. And finally, there's the threat from within, which is resistance to change. Now, can something be done about it? It's difficult, but
but nothing's impossible. In politics, everything's possible. It's possible. It takes a lot of effort, but it's possible to transform the human rights movement. I mean, for the human rights movement to transform itself. Nobody can transform it. And so my sh short list of to do would be something like this. Number one, be strategic and be political and stop uh, barricading yourself behind the notion that human rights should be uh, nonpartisan. Yes, nonpartisan it should be, but it should be political. And it should, you know, watch out what is taking shape in the country and try to be part of it. Number two, rethink the boundary between rights and social justice policies. And that falls from what I was talking about on fairness. Number three, build a, an entirely new attitude to national identity. Stop, you know, we, we, you can no longer uh, carry uh, uh, the, uh, the traitor, na traitor to the nation as a badge of honor as we all carried it in the 90s. It's no longer uh, a, a, a good, a good thing because in the past, we were called traitors by the supporters of rather, you know, marginal, ultra-nationalist um, uh, parties and their supporters, now it's the mainstream. Um, next, to challenge uh, the, uh, to, to, to overcome the challenge of um, sustainability, we need to build new business model. And there was a recent uh, brilliant report by Ed Ricoche uh, published by CSIS that uh, analyzes the types of activism and proposes uh, ways forward. And last, do not grow old. Look at what young people are doing, pay attention, and learn from that. And if the human rights movement succeeds in transforming itself in such a way and combines with this trends of 3D democracy that I think are uh, happening anyway, then we can hope to have participatory democracy. Now, it may be that my best case scenario of the future, which is about participatory or participatory democracy, is slowly advancing through innumerable and as yet marginal uh, actions and campaigns and initiatives in Central and Eastern Europe. And um, yeah, that's so they're still marginal, but I believe that the future is already here. It's scattered all around us. But its signal is mixed with lots of noise. And no herald trumpets its arrival. Today, there may be no sensational achievements to make the headlines in uh, participatory democracy in Central and Eastern Europe, just small steps. But stay tuned. Thank you. So I'd first like to thank Dimitrina for a um, powerful and thought-provoking presentation. And now I'm delighted to hand things over to Roger. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Dimitrina, for a more comprehensive and, shall I say, controversial view of where we've been and, and where we're going. Your presentation uh, covers my 30 years here at NED, and uh, I remember back to those days, and uh, it was, uh, it was quite, a, quite a set of emotions that came forward you know, through your presentation. Um, I really think you've helped us to better understand what the word unfairness means in the Central and Eastern European context. Uh, this is a word we often hear used in political terms and economic terms, but you really offer a sociological view of it that I think helps us to understand uh, where we are today. Um, I remember those debates that we had here at NED right after 1989 between shock therapy and gradual transitions, between lustration and thick lines about where we go and how we help. And I would ask, um, in respect to your presentation, whether or not fair play was really possible back then. I mean, I think we were all struggling to help those uh, like yourself who were trying to accomplish these 
Herculean tasks uh, and avoid the moral catastrophe that you speak about. But um, in countries that had little transitions of rule of law, new parliaments and new constitutions, and sometimes not even those, um, whether or not it was really possible to have fair play on top of uh, everything else that was happening. Um, but I think you certainly make a strong point when you say that the freedom part of dignity wasn't enough. It had to be something more, something related to this fairness issue. Um, in terms of your suggestions on where we go from here, um, certainly agreeing that the human rights side of it is non-negotiable. And uh, to answer your question, this is something that Ned has never stopped funding uh, in this region and elsewhere. Um, but I think it's a tall task in trying to redress the three or take on the three tasks that you laid out, uh, redressing social injustice. Um, because unfortunately, it seems to us at this moment that the illiberal or populist forces have really, in a sense, captured some of these categories. When you talk about re redressing social injustice in the region today, you think of PISA's 500 plus program, for example, or Fidesz's workfare, or the early, early retirement uh, incentives that are being offered. Um, we see populist more than the Democrats offering to redress what society often perceives as the social injustices of those transition periods. Second of all, reclaiming the national identity. Um, this also is not easy, as you mentioned, in a period where um, populist governments are using this anti-migrant, pro-nationalist sentiment to, in, a set, in effect, replace um, the positive aspects of the national identity that were rediscovered after 1989, that for the first chance, people had a chance to talk about national traditions in the history of those individual countries. Um, this is something I spent a lot of time studying about uh, during my college days, but it's something that almost gets no, no addressing in today's uh, Central Europe. And I think it's really difficult for that to happen again when you see an increasingly shrinking media space, when you don't have access to national schools or civic education programs. So reclaiming national identity is a challenge that we're dealing with here. We understand the need for this, what, what, you would call, what, what I would call civic patriotism, which you, which you spelled out as, uh, as a way to, uh, to, to uh, reclaim this area, but um, it's not an easy task. And finally, um, ensuring citizen participation. Um, this is also something that is difficult to do when some of the best and the brightest have left these countries. We've heard uh, your colleague, Ivan Krastev, speak about the, the emigration and the demographics of what has happened uh, throughout the region. Um, also, citizens decline in trust in political institutions and in traditional parties. Um, how to go about transforming and sort of reinvigorating a citizen view that participation is something actually worthwhile. Um, finally, coming to the challenge of 3D democracy or, or digital democracy, um, this is also something that is challenging us greatly here at NED. We're mostly on the defensive, it seems, in trying to push back against both internal and external forces that are using the internet, using digital means, in effect, to degrade democracy, to undermine the tr those transitions after 1989. Um, going on the offensive, as you mentioned, through programs that support hackathons or new tech tools are appealing to young people um, to use technology in effect to fight corruption, to tackle some of the tasks uh, that, has, that as a result of this uh, unfairness of the 1990s is something that we're also doing, but it seems like the bad guys are winning at this point. Um, and how we go about, in a, in a sense, uh, using that technology to bolster the traditional the traditional institutions that are the pillars of democracies in these countries are uh, the politics, the political parties, the institutions, rule of law, the constitutions. Um, what I see and what I worry about is that this digital democracy, in a sense, is going in a non-traditional, in a more um, dangerous direction. Uh, we've seen how many of the frustrating, the frustrated citizens of the region have taken to the streets in a sense, uh, using digital democracy to organize demonstrations when they feel they have no recourse to the normal politics, through the, through the new systems that are in place there. We've seen the demonstrations in Slovakia, in Hungary, in Armenia, are organized in part uh, through this digital democracy. In some cases, it's had positive influence 
influence, in other cases that it hasn't had an influence at all, but it's something that in effect brings us right back to those street movements of 1989, um, and, and I hope this time we'll be able to get it right. Uh, I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Roger, for those uh, in <laughs> incisive comments. What I'd first like to do, I'll give Dimitrina an opportunity to respond to anything Roger said. I might have a question or two myself, uh, but if you'd like to, you can take the opportunity to react to what Roger has offered. Uh, thank you, uh, Roger. And I don't know whether fair play was possible. I really don't know. We didn't try it. We didn't think of it. Actually, we in Bulgaria didn't quite think of it. Uh, the Czechs took it slower. They tried to put in place a framework but they probably did, didn't follow through and... Uh, okay, sorry. Okay. They, they didn't follow through, they didn't really enforce that, so they ended up roughly, probably a bit better, probably less frustration than us. Um, but whether, whether or not it was possible, well, uh, you know, my view is everything is possible in politics, you know. I, I, who, who would have expected that uh, Korea, North Korea would be... Uh, erasing its uh, nuclear, you know, but then you read it in the newspaper. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's possible, uh, and we didn't do it. it. We just didn't do it. It was possible. We didn't. We were carried in a different direction. We copy-pasted. We, we were advised, we in Bulgaria at least, we were advised by, uh, you know, the sages of market economy, of market liberalism, that this is what we needed to do. The Poles had started doing it. We looked at Poland. We thought it was working. Well, we are, were a bit, you know, terrified by the first results, but we had the impression that there was no other way. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it might have been possible if we, if we were wiser than we were. Uh, now, um, you say that Fides, too, is uh, proposing uh, measures to redress this feeling of frustration and unfairness, but that's why it's winning. In fact, my point is that these are three strategic areas where liberals need to have their own uh, policies. They may be like or unlike those of Fidesz, and I don't care. You know, they have to, there have to be something that addresses that, those grievances. <laughs> and that's why, uh, uh, you know, PIS is winning because they, uh, they, they do that. They say all oh, those who are in the top there, in fact, form a communist nomenclature and so on, and we will now. Hmm. Yeah. So that, they, <laughs> that they, they, we ha I, I'm not saying let's imitate them. All I'm saying we also need to, we need to not turn our back and say that's for the populace. And similarly with the nationalism. And I don't suggest at all that these are easy things. But if it's easy, it's not my worth at all. It's not. It, it, it's <laughs> you know. If something's not close to impossible, I, I wouldn't bother to, to work on it. <laughs> and, and, and I think uh, that's what makes life exciting. You know? If it's just, uh, of course, to be strategic also means to start with a, a, a lower hanging fruit, right? And to see what's uh, more, you know, it, it's to be done easier. But I think we need to aim high. It's difficult, but why is it so difficult? By the way, I don't know if you uh, have noticed that, but probably not because you are, most of you are Westerners, but it strikes me when I'm among like-minded people in the West that they're much more comfortable with uh, what you called uh, civic patriotism. You know, East European intellectuals and liberals and are, are really uncomfortable with that. I I'm telling you, we are not. We are kind of, oh, that's, you know, oh. We are such internationalists. <laughs> universalists, and I think we have to seriously reconsider that. And I think there's no winning for liberals without a strategy on how to do that. There are ways. For example, the human rights movement, rather than only relying on the United Nations uh, framework, human rights framework of treaties, of covenants and conventions, and so on, and on the case law of the International Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, the regional system, and so on. Why don't we also, not giving up those frameworks, but look inside our national legacy, fish out the liberals, take them as models, put them somehow on our, you know, just identify with them. We're not doing that at all. That's all for the patriots. 
that is in Bulgaria for Ataka, for the nationalists. That's not good. That takes us now. That's a blind alley. We absolutely need to reclaim this space. Now, if this takes another generation to do it, so be it. Maybe the people who are already there are too much you know, stamped as traitors. That's very unfortunate. But unless you know, the human rights movement really tries to reclaim that, I don't think we would be turning the tide. Um, and I agree with everything else that you said about the difficulty of uh, citizen participation and about the dangers of digital. Digital itself is neutral. I think, I don't know if I made it clear. Uh, the, the terrible things that you can say about online uh, and how it's the echo chambers and how people only retweet things they agree with and so on, there's lots of bad stuff in that. But digital democracy, it's not about the head of state tweeting to the electorate. Uh, it's about citizens making decisions using digital tools to actually participate in all stages of the democratic process from just being consulted to being part of the decision-making procedure. And these things are made possible by technology. I'll stop here. So uh, I, I would really like to endorse this idea that um, more serious thinking on the ways in which uh, the idea of civic patriotism can be expressed is, uh, is needed. And I suspect it's not only within the region under discussion here, but in uh, democracies farther afield. I'd like to ask a question to Dimitrina, and if Roger uh, wishes to answer as well, that would be terrific. Uh, and it has to do with differentiation between the region, because you've, you've alluded to Bulgaria as an individual case, and I think Bulgaria, in relative terms, has had an admittedly uh, really rough go of it uh, compared to, say, the Baltic states, just as an example. Uh, and they've had their fair share of, uh, of tough times over the, the last years. Uh, but even within um, other parts of this grouping of countries, the Visegrad countries, it strikes me that while there are some clear trends that have emerged, some of them are more acute than others. Um, some of them defy, I think, some of the common assumptions about, say, economic performance and the way in which the societies are reacting. Some of these economies uh, have performed rather well, uh, even in the wider European context, and yet, uh, some of the features you described are evident in many of them, if not all of them, but not to the same degree by any measure. So you alluded to, I think, Estonia at the outset of your presentation, which um, seems to have navigated the terrain pretty well. Uh, the Czech Republic, um, which I'm familiar with, uh, also on so many measures has performed quite well, um, and yet they have some of these features. But I'm just wondering if you take a moment to talk a little bit about whether this is simply a, a region-wide phenomenon that can be applied with some degree of uniformity across the countries, or whether we might differentiate a little bit in our thinking on some of the uh, particular challenges you outlined. Thank you. I think it's the same flu that's going around, but some people experience it. Some countries have it in a much more severe form, and Bulgaria has it in a kind of a mild form at the moment. And of course, if you look at Freedom House, you'll see the steep decline is, of course, in Poland and Hungary. And there are reasons for that. And they're kind of dialectical, or if you wish, paradoxical reasons. Hungary and Poland are receiving, for example, they are much more anti-EU in terms of, you know, well, rather bark than, than bite, than Bulgaria. You know, our Prime Minister uh, Boyko Borisov is a, a good child, the, 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 the good boy of, 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 of uh, Frau Merkel, and we're getting some funding and so on, and now we are chairing the European Union. Uh, but why is, for example, um, the anti-European Union sentiment stronger in Poland and Hungary, some people say, well, because the funding is much more massive. We get peanuts compared to what Poland and, uh, and Hungary get uh, relative to uh, you know, per the, the per capita uh, that they get from the EU. However, the Poles feel that much of that funding goes back to the net contributor countries, such as Germany and France, in the form of uh, income, uh, uh, in, in the form of um, 
buying goods and services, buying infrastructure, buying expertise, and that goes back to them uh, as, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, profits and markets. Uh, and, you know, probably they feel much more than we do that the European Union is a kind of a uh, double-edged sword. So it's easier to tell the Poles, and they, and they would believe you, the European Union is not the Alpha and Omega, it's a new colonial, and the Poles will say, ah, yeah, because they have more experience, exactly, that the funding's bigger, uh, their con contribution to the economy is bigger. So you see Poland and Hungary are stronger economies than, Bul than Bulgaria, but that's probably a problem as well. So, uh, yeah, and certainly I think there are, of course, uh, regional differences, but I think the trend is clear. It's just more expressed in some countries. Most worryingly, of course, in uh, Hungary and Poland. I would just add that the support for, uh, Western support for uh, democracy, human rights, and for the transformations was less in, in Romania and Bulgaria as it in comparison to Central Europe. And I would also say that just the financial crisis has hit uh, Southern Europe much harder than, than Central and, and, and Northern Europe, um, Bulgaria being the poorest of the EU member states and just uh, having a much harder time of it in the 90s and uh, 2000s than, than Central Europe. So I'm, I'm going to pose one more question, but for those of you who have questions, if you can uh, prepare to ask them when, when I come around, if you could just introduce yourself, keep the questions succinct try to get as many in before uh, time runs out. But I'd just like to come back to the, um, the digital information dimension of this and just pose questions to each of you on this count, which is, um, you know, Dimitrina, you said that the, the technology is neutral, and to some degree I think that's true. But in a period where uh, state sovereignty has started to take more of a privilege, which is, I think, um, you know, countering some of the um, supranational human rights assumptions we had coming into the recent period, but it also has implications for the way in which states treat their media systems, both traditional and new media. Um, it raises real questions about um, the degree of atomization we have and collective action, and so, and it also raises real questions about state manipulation and investment. So uh, it's not just um, authoritarian countries that are investing in uh, a wide range of tools to manipulate the online space. Uh, those sorts of investments, as we're learning, can't be discounted. And so while the, you know, the tools and the technical parts that go into today's digital media, I would agree, are neutral, at least right now and for the time being, uh, I'm personally not convinced that the technology, when we think about it as it's operating today, is neutral. There are advantages and disadvantages, there are resource uh, disadvantages that occur and, and ways in which this is applied. And I would argue that today, um, ordinary activists and um, liberal democratic activists uh, are on the weak side of the ledger relatively speaking. So I, I just wonder um, if there's anything that you've seen that you believe can kind of coax out the promise mm -hmm. in a more effective way for some of the things you've described. And I know, Roger, you've been working uh, considerably on these issues, so if you'd like to add to this after Dimitrina, I'd welcome that. And then we'll turn to questions from the audience. Yeah, yes, thank you. That's uh, very important and very interesting. I do believe technology is neutral. Uh, I'm fully aware and have studied the, 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 the dark side of technology. However, look what happens, and you, we're looking for hope. I'm a utopian. I'm looking for, you know, for the future, and I want to see where, where, where it's coming from. In 2006, it was not China or Russia. It was the United States, Japan, and the European Union that started secret negotiations for the so-called ACTA, that is the anti-counterfeit treaty agreement to many things, but basically to, to close down the internet, to make it absolutely controlled, to make it impossible, for example, for people to, uh, to freely communicate across borders, to enable the state to come to your um, 
study and take your computer very intrusively to see that you have been listening to music, copyrighted and so on and other things and other things and actually to, uh, to be able to control you. And what happened was that the Poles, Polish, the Polish part of Anonymous and then others saw what was going on. WikiLeaks we leaked it, leaked the, the treaty. By the way, the treaty was secretly signed in Tokyo in 2011, I think. And then the you know, kids on the internet to whom this was leaked started a campaign. They went in the street, they started the protests, and that spread in no time like uh, a wildfire, and in two weeks, ACTA was gone. The European Parliament that would, had been kept in the dark about this treaty said, hey, what, wait a second, what, what's that? The European Commission is doing what here? And they killed it. And that's, you know, uh, yes, states are, you know, if, if states are left to do that, they will put total surveillance on us. You know, they, they will not be the good guys. But I think that there is a lot of uh, hope for resistance against that. That's coming from different quarters, and it's a fight. So, but technology is neutral. Technology is neutral. And if you have not studied the beauty of uh, blockchain technology, uh, please do. Not in order to understand the, the technical side, which uh, we will not, because we are not, uh, you know, uh, we are not code writers, programmers, but just how the principles are, how they eliminate the middleman, how it's possible to secure the vote, which is a transaction, without uh, actually needing to worry that it can be hacked, falsified, or manipulated, and so on. So it, it, it's beautiful stuff, and uh, I, I think there's a lot of hope in it. And Roger? I would agree, Chris, that we're on the short side of the ledger when it comes to uh, this, this issue. Um, but I would just, I see two silver linings, as Dimitrina told us earlier. Um, the first is quality content amplified digitally is uh, winning an audience and is pushing back against some of this uh, negative uh, use of, of, uh, of technology that we see over the internet. And second of all, it's use as a tool to combat corruption. We also see that making some headway on a national level now. I mean, up to this point when Dimitrina was talking about increasing uh, public participation, you saw um, on a local level people using uh, technology for participatory budgeting and types of projects like this but in, in a country like Ukraine, you can see the, the technology being used at a national level to, to tackle some of the corruption issues. All right, great, thank you. So if uh, there are questions, we can take them. I'm gonna start right here, and then we'll work our way back. Uh, Mark Plattner, Journal of Democracy. It was a very provocative and eloquent presentation, Dimitrina. Um, one thing I wondered about, your vision of the 3D uh, democracy of the future, as far as I recall, didn't include any mention of political parties. Are they, in your view, obsolete? Uh, it's, it's part of the old democracy not to be carried forward into this new 3D era, or is there a role for it? Do you want to take that one? How do you want to proceed? We'll Good. Um, no, no. I think 3D G, uh, th the 3D is completely a procedural thing. It can, it's not necessarily, you know, it's democracy. That's true. But we didn't take about the content because, you know, you can have direct digital, deliberative, uh, anti-liberal regime. That's why we, we need the fourth dimension. And I, I, I view direct democracy, enabled by digital, as complementary to, uh, to political parties. I think it's it, maybe in the distant, in the remote future, uh, there are such Silicon Valley visionaries who say that actually in the distant future, we will actually uh, not need the state anymore even, but I, I don't want to go that far. I think for the moment, what I'm observing is that, is that political parties themselves are becoming more open to direct decision making. So, no, no, it's far too early to talk about the end of representative democracy, but when people on the red side, when they say, 
uh, not happy with uh, participation or whatever. Uh, uh, yes, in that group, there are the people who, in fact, would be happy with, uh, I don't know, a dictatorship, you know, but most of those people, I think, ho I hope, um, uh, are people who, in fact, want more, want more participation in addition to political parties. So, Dimitrina, it makes me wonder whether our Silicon Valley visionaries have been a little too visionary sometimes for our own good. So, why don't we take... Um, Two more questions on, we'll take three here, because we have- There are many East Europeans there, by the way. So, yeah, let's start here, and then we can work our way. We'll take a bunch, and then we'll, there are a lot of hands. So let's start here. Thank you, so I'm Alicia Phillips Mandeville from IREX, and thank you a lot, I appreciated your presentation, in particular the point that technology is a bit like the Force. You, there's Jedi and there's Sith, but they're still using the Force, so there's, I think, a bit of a parallel there. Um, I wondered if you'd speak a little bit to um, the perceived complexity of digital tools and participation. Um, partly because I think in early days of thinking about civic partic participation in technology, we all got very excited about the idea that this was a much more universal way for people to easily participate. Um, but the reality appears to be that there are many people who perceive the complexity of using that tool as a barrier to participation. And whether that's kind of in an office environment or that's actually voting or that's deliberative conversations, um, there's a perception that if you don't understand blockchain, you can't use this participatory technology. Um, so I'd actually be curious to hear how you feel like that affects the actual capacity for participation. Why don't we take the questioners in the row right in front? There are at least two or three. So, yep, start there. Uh, Richard Ulihan, I was AFL-CIO in Latin America. Uh, you mentioned youth. Um, how is youth coming? Maybe give us an example of, Boli of uh, I was going to say Bolivia, <laughs> Bulgaria. Um, 15, 16, 20, 21 year olds. Are they finding in their education system, in the other parts of society, a way to grow and to think, or are they finding blockages that keep them from being as creative and, uh, and, and going forward? How are they doing? Let's go right here. Oh, okay. Hey, um, so my name is Kristina. I am from Slovakia. I used to be in top dog in politics in Slovakia. Seen many things. Now I'm in Silicon Valley VC, so I see technology way beyond what you describe as digital technology. One comment, um, question for Dimitrina. I did not hear you mention refugees that affected how things are shifting big time, and I didn't see a single word about it. And then second comment to Christopher, um, do you see in your analysis any correlation between startups and promotion of startups, kind of Silicon Valley culture, and democracy. Thank you. So we have um, three sets of questions there. So why don't, if you want to address those in whatever fashion you deem fit. Okay, uh, thank you for these questions. The perceived complexity of digital. Well, uh, I, I, there's no way I can explain how things work, work to, to my 87-year-old um, mother. Um, but uh, it's a generational thing. Uh, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, we are not to be, uh, will not be around for, 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 you know, the older generation for long. And uh, actually, that's the other thing about technology. And it's not a good thing. We are all users. We don't know how things work. But... Um, I'm not intimidated by the perceived complexity, not because I will understand anything about how programs work, but because there are user-friendly things and there are things that are not so user-friendly. And I'm sure that the, the demand for citizen participation and direct decision-making and deliberation would drive forward these technologies to make it possible. For example, I don't know if you know about the California Card Project, uh, which enables people to vote, to, to deliberate and vote on issues and how it works. And in order to participate in that, uh, as far as I understand it, it's not at all necessary to, you, you just need your mobile and you just, 
you know, can type your views and you uh, vote on other people's views. And in fact, it, you don't need ha to, to know how it works. So, you know, it's a not, not um, it's a democratic policy issue, however, because, uh, uh, you know, uh, fair play would mean that we want to enable those who will have absolutely no internet access, like the Estonians are doing. The Estonians uh, are, are only voting online uh, since, I think, 2011, but those who don't want to touch a computer still have the possibility to go, you know, to, to, to use the, 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 the paper uh, ballot. Uh, so that, that's possible. Uh, the youth in Bulgaria, both, it's both uh, um, possibilities and blockages, depends whom we're talking about. We have a, a, a large Roma uh, minority, and these kids, they're completely, uh, you know, they're, they're not equal to others. They're discriminated against, they're marginalized, they're segregated, they, they, they study in uh, racially segregated schools, and segregation is increasing. And I take this opportunity to mention that many things have been said about uh, the uh, decline of liberal democracy in the region, but one thing that's not been really properly highlighted, and which I consider probably the most worrying thing, is the destiny of the Roma minority and the unraveling of whatever achievement we had reached. So for, for many poor children, for Roma children in particular, what possibilities? There's only blockages. They, they, they do not have access to online. Uh, but, you know, the average age of children that have a, um, I was going to say bank account, uh, an, an email, uh, is six years old. Those who, you know, can afford it, and most Bulgarians can. And by the way, in Bulgaria, you, you would be surprised, but it's the country with probably the highest internet speed in the world, or among the highest, very much unlike Germany or, or the United States, uh, uh, amazingly, but that's, that's, that's the fact. I didn't mention anything about refugees because I was uh, really galloping through my presentation, didn't want to, uh, to, do, to say more about the, the past and the explanation, but there's a whole set of views and theories that say that actually, well, of course, Fides, uh, uh, one because of, and PIS also in Poland, uh, campaigning on the issue of refugees. Um, actually, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the um, on excluding any refugees, or shutting down the country for refugees. Um, I didn't ha say anything only because I had no time, but I believe that that is a huge issue. But look, uh, we have a demographic crisis. People talk about a demographic panic. Ivan Kristev is right when he speaks about demographic panic. He's not right when he says that the potential liberal voters have left the region. He's half right. That's part true. But in fact, the diaspora uh, consists of people who are professional and who are, let's say, potential liberal voters, but also many who are, uh, you know, who are taking care of elderly uh, bedridden people who are cleaning houses and, and you know, or who are picking uh, uh, strawberries and, and peaches in, in Greece or in Spain and so on. So it's a diverse uh, uh, group of migrants. But Bulgaria, which was 9 million uh, in 89, is now 7 million. People, many people have left. We have a very low birth rate, and it's a demographic crisis. Given that, why was it that we didn't welcome refugees from the, from the Middle East? And, you know, I don't know the, the numbers exactly, but the other countries are in a similar position. All would do with some fresh uh, workforce. Instead, uh, you know, there was this absolutely uh, terrible virulent xenophobia uh, all over Eastern and Central Europe. And this is not a rational choice. In fact, this is one of the derivatives of that insult that I was talking about that turns into uh, abuse of others, seeking comfort in my group, and hating the other group. Um, that's, you know, that's this ethno-national feeling, which I think results from, from there. So yeah, I, I uh, could speak a lot to, to the issue of refugees. There's just no time. So let's go to Rob in the back, and then we'll move to the other side. We can take uh, several more questions now. 
Thank you, Christopher and, and Dimitrina. Thank you very much. I'm Rob Benjamin. I'm with uh, NDI, the National Democratic Institute. We had a, a, a interesting set of discussions in Central Europe among youth activists in the NGO community a few months ago. And Howard Dean is on our board, and he made the trip with us, I'm happy to say, and he knows a thing or two about politics. Um, and he observed that uh, in his, he wasn't thinking particularly of Central Europe, he was thinking more globally, that uh, the millennial population and the notion of civic activism and digital democracy resides largely in mobilizing for very immediate ends. So the kinds of movements and things that you've discussed that are project-based, what's not as apparent is the organizing the notion of not just mobilizing, but organizing, building political capital, even social capital for politics that aggregates, that creates uh, the ability to be more robust in political expression, not as atomistic. Uh, part of that was of consideration around the use of technology, but I think uh, going to your point, Dimitrina, at the heart of what we're talking about, what's the strategy? And really, what's the political strategy for civic engagement? How do we take the tools of mobilization in the contemporary sense and marry it to a more organizational, institutional type of gumshoe politics, as we say here, true enough conventional, but in order to take that energy and aggregate it and make it more cohesive uh, for larger types of political expression. Great, thank you. And why don't we take a couple more and then we'll work our way to the front. We'll try to get everyone that's here before we have to wrap up. If you can keep your questions succinct, it would be great. Uh, John Pfeffer, Institute for Policy Studies. Thank you, Dimitrina, for a great presentation. Uh, I want to ask you about the relationship between illiberalism uh, in Eastern Europe and other parts of the world, in other parts of Europe, obviously here in the United States. Um, is there a deeper root cause than unfairness, perhaps, that would unite or, or help us understand this larger wave? Because obviously these other countries didn't go through a transition uh, like Eastern Europe or went through a different transition. And if it's, is this just a superficial resemblance between these illiberal trends? And if there is a deeper connection between uh, or a deeper explanation, does it have any bearing on the kinds of uh, recommendations you provide in the end? Thank you for that. And let's take the last questions right here, starting with the gentleman right next to you. Thanks. Thank you. I'm Richard Hill with Vote Our Voice. I'm actually, um, I have a startup. I'm one of the uh, digital uh, 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 entrepreneurs that you're talking about that has a solution for uh, voting governance. One of the issues that we find and why we are doing the work that we're doing, uh, which directly impacts what you're talking about, uh, the, the, when you talk about fairness, is disenfranchisement that we especially see in the uh, millennial generation, the, the younger folks. And where that disenfranchisement comes from is that there's a lack of transparency and accountability in the political system itself, and they don't feel as though they're, uh, that they're represented or their ideas or values are uh, are represented. That would be part of the reason why I think you would see an exit of uh, nationals from a particular country and so forth um, when you don't feel like the people really uh, are taking into account what it is that you, um, what you believe. And so um, that would be part of uh, uh, my, gu I guess, guess my question is uh, what research have you done with uh, respect to uh, transparency and accountability within the political systems itself. Great, thank you for that. And why don't we just take the last couple that are here, if we can do that. Thank you. Uh, my, name is Austin, oh, my name is Austin Dohler. I'm a uh, graduate student at GW. And uh, returning return to the idea of, returning to the idea of uh, civic nationalism, uh, to what extent does re the revival of democracy and uh, transparency as core national values, does, to what extent does that risk um, maintaining ex exclusionary and xenophobic notions towards the other and ethnic minorities and nations? Could we, by emphasizing civic nationalism, is there a risk of defining democracy as a value and benefit for the, for the in-group, but excluding the out-group still? Thank you. Great. Thanks for that. And let's take 
take the last one here, and then we'll let uh, Dimitrina respond. And if Roger would like to add to that, and then we'll wrap up. So go ahead, sir. Hi, my name is Jonathan. I'm from the Hudson Institute. Um, this is really short. I was just wondering, what, what do you mean by nationalism? And also, how do you think that nationalism can mix with like European liberalism? Thanks for that. OK, Dimitrina, you can address whatever part of that you like. No, th thank you. These are all very uh, difficult questions for me, actually. <laughs> I uh, don't. I, I don't think I can uh, uh, do justice to to them. Uh, uh, I agree with the observation that to date, young people mobilize usually around some immediate cause, rather than some kind of a general political project, but uh, uh, except for the, for, for the so-called Arab, what is, it, what is it now called? Uprising. The Arab Spring or? Uprising. Uprising, so yes. Uh, that was kind of umbrella political, anti-regime. Um, but uh, uh, actually, I think the recipe of what to do was very much implied in your question when you asked how uh, you know how the more traditional political parties can be uh, can, can be combined with these new forms of expression. Uh, well, uh, I don't know. I don't have the recipe, but that's what needs to happen. That that's the area of uh, uh, of, um, of further thinking and research. And now, the, uh, John uh, Pfeffer, that's a very very difficult question about whether or not there is a family resemblance superficial family resemblance between illiberalism in uh, Central Eastern and the rest of the world. Um, I think it's not, uh, we humans are very, very uh, biased to see patterns in everything. So, I mean, it's not absolutely out of the question that it's uh, a kind of a coincidence. I personally think it's not. I think there are root, that, that there are things that are similar uh, that somehow are even deeper lying uh, and express themselves in the different regions differently. For Central Eastern Europe is this kind of fundamental unfairness of the early 90s that then m morphed into all these factors. For other regions, I believe that there would be other causes. This needs to be studied more carefully, but that's a very difficult question, uh, a very good one. Um, what was the next? Uh, The lack of transparency. I, I know I haven't uh, studied in, in depth uh, uh, accountability and transparency in my region. Um, I don't know. It, it, it certainly, uh, it, it certainly when, you know, when people in, for example, in the West feel disenfranchised because of that, and that's uh, not because, but that's with uh, lack of transparency and accountability, uh, that's pretty universal. You know, that's also in Central Eastern Europe, that's um, in the West, uh, and that's a, a big driver. It's a, it's, people are easy to mobilize around the lack of uh, transparency. In fact, the example that I was giving earlier about this ACTA, uh, uh, the treaty on, um, uh, against which uh, the youth of Europe uh, 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 revolted successfully, uh, that was exactly about the lack of transparency because there were secret negotiations. And you, you see what happens also when WikiLeaks leaks something, you know, sensitive. People are very sensitive to, to it. They, they feel they have been cheated. And again, that has a lot to do with dignity. It's just, you know, it's just an insult on dignity to keep things secret from people. So that's... Um, uh, I think that's ha that has a global significance uh, about civic uh, nationalism and whether uh, it's vital for democracy um, and whether it can be made to be uh, not exclusionary but inclusive of difference. Uh, I personally wouldn't. I, I am one of those, you know, <laughs> Central Eastern Europeans who have a problem with the term nationalism. Uh, like with many other terms, it's not about the content so much. It's about whose idea, who, who is behind it. So if I say I'm a nationalist, the first thing, oh, so that means I'm like those people. 
And that's how ideological words uh, uh, work, you know. Uh, communism is not a bad idea if you take it as a, uh, you know, the end state of a, f of a free and equal society. But as soon as uh, those people who kill, you know, half of the population and put everybody in camps are communists, then I don't care what's the content of the communist ideal. I'm not with them. So similarly, nationalism is probably not something to embrace. That's why I, I don't think I even should have mentioned it. If I did, I shouldn't have. I should talk about the set of values around the national interest, uh, about national sovereignty, about national pride, you know, this kind of thing. I wouldn't uh, uh, even talk about nationalism. Uh, and what was the last? Uh, that was it. Oh. You did it. It Thank wasn't you. impossible. <laughs> All right. That's Thank great. You. Roger? Just maybe three quick points. Um, to the question earlier from our, our union colleague about education, um, what we hear over and over again from across the region is the lack of serious civic education and the lack of serious history courses um, that both look at the period of totalitarianism in these countries, the transitions after 1989. I mean, in most of the schools across Central and Eastern Europe, you see history stopping at 1939. And part of this is, I think, has an impact on what we're just talking about in terms of uh, civic nationalism or civic patriotism. Um, second question about uh, transparency and accountability um, from our tech uh, colleague. Um, we have seen a lot of success across the region in terms of using tech technology to hold politicians accountable for their promises and their performance. Um, technology under the rubric of truth -a meters or something like this, pioneered by my colleague Ivana here. Um, a lot of those have had some very successful impact on how politicians and parties operate. Uh, so I do see some positive uh, and some, some optimism uh, in terms of using that in, uh, for transparency and accountability purposes. Finally, just for the, 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 the issue of nationalism or civic patriotism. Um, when Dimitrina and I sat down to discuss uh, this, um, she mentioned, she used a different phrase, I thought, that was very appropriate uh, that I understand as a historian, to look at the civic traditions um, that existed previously in Bulgaria and in Central Europe, as opposed to just, as she mentioned, appealing to the UN or to European human rights uh, standards and norms. Um, I think this is something that, that the region lacks because of that educational problem that I mentioned. And I think it's something that they can look to um, to instill a sense of pride and, and, and difference from Brussels or from, or from whatever uh, capital is, is setting uh, many of these universalist norms, to use your phrase. Uh, and that this is something that throughout the region there are examples of this and can be appealed to rather than ceding this territory to the extreme nationalists. And I would make the distinction there between just nationalism and extreme nationalism, where you see the, the dangers of, of, of also some of the, the crimes of the 20th century. So I'll take this opportunity to thank Roger for those comments and for all of his comments uh, at this session, but really to um, uh, recognize Dimitrina for her presentation and reminding us that we should pursue the art of the possible. Uh, you really did a terrific job both of, I think, provoking a lot of thoughts but also um, an exceptional job addressing this wide range of questions too. And um, I'm hopeful that everyone enjoyed this as much as I did sitting up between the two presenters. So thanks to you both. <laughs>